Good morning, Austin Oaks Church. Hey, can we just thank John and Valerie again for just the blessing of having them here this morning leading us in worship. Thank you, guys. Hey, if you're new with us today, uh, my name is Chad McCartney. I'm the pastor of discipleship here at Austin Oaks Church. Uh, The usual person preaching is a lot more exciting and better looking than I am, but you're getting what you paid for this morning, so... Uh, actually, I uh, would love to, for you to get to know us a little bit as a church, and we are a church that strives to be simply about Jesus, and you're going to see as, this, uh, as we dive into our series today that that's the heartbeat of who we are, and everything we want to do is to help you meet him, uh, to know him, and to follow him uh, as your Savior and Lord. So uh, we're excited to have you here. We're excited to have everyone here. If you're joining us online, we're glad you're joining us as well, as well as uh, you out in the courtyard that are joining us from all the different spots that uh, you're checking in today. It's good to have the body of Christ together as we worship. Uh, today, uh, we continue our series titled, Be the Movement. The last couple of weeks, Pastor Brandon kind of took a, a little bit of a sidebar uh, to kind of lean into some big picture vision and future things that we see uh, for our church as we fulfill our mission. Now we're back to our series t- titled, Be the Movement. And the heart of this is really, uh, like we talk about, being simply about Jesus. And the Gospel of Luke is one of the letters that Luke wrote Uh, to a Gentile, Luke was a Gentile as well, and wrote it to tell people about who this Jesus is and to help people outside the typical people of God, the Israelites, to understand him as well, that he's a a savior for all people. And so this whole series is all about what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does that mean? What did it mean then? Uh, How do we understand those things? And what does it look like today to to follow him as well. And I'm excited about where we're at in this journey. In fact, Luke chapter six, where we're gonna be today, is one of the richest and most pivotal chapters in the gospel of Luke. Uh, Prior to, you know, the, the heading into Jerusalem and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're gonna see Jesus kinda turns the corner here and lays down some things that are really key to understanding who he is and where he's leading his followers. You're going to see up to this point, Jesus has been on the scene for a little over a year, and he's been calling different people to follow him in a general way up until this point. And here in chapter 6, Jesus is going to select out, after a, a night of prayer up on the mountain, he's going to select out 12 of his disciples, if you read the beginning of the chapter, his apostles, those who would carry on his ministry after he leaves. And he's going to dive in and dig in to some really key principles about who he is and why he came in this chapter. Real pivotal. In fact, even how he does it communicates something that's incredibly powerful and and people of his time, and in in particular Luke as he was writing it and the other gospel writers that write about this particular moment realize this was a key pivotal moment for Jesus and what he was doing with his disciples because it mirrors a similar event that would have been known to all of them in this time, and in particular the apostles of Jesus. It kind of mirrors uh, when God brought the people of Israel out of Egypt into the wilderness. He saves them. He saves them from Egypt, and then he sends Moses up onto the mountain to receive his law or his truth, and Moses comes down off the mountain, and he starts telling the people not how to be saved. He says, this is how you live now that you're saved. This is what God's new community of people looks like. And Jesus is, in a sense, replicating this in this moment. He's been up on the mountain. Now he comes down. He's got all his disciples, his 12. He's got all these other people around him. And he begins for the first time an extended time of teaching with his disciples, calling them into saying, this is what my kingdom looks like. This is what my new community of people look like. And that's where we are in this journey. So I want you to see four things that Jesus is going to to pull out. Literally, each of these sections could be a whole series. That's how rich this teaching is. So I was having to condense it down. I think I can get through this in about three hours today. I'm kidding. We got done in in plenty of time. But I'm stepping back and kind of giving you a 40,000-foot view of this section. And there's four big things I think Jesus is emphasizing 
in here, okay? Three of them, or excuse me, two of them uh, refer to a radical change in our identity. Okay, so two things that are going to radically identify us as Christians. When you step into Jesus' kingdom, there's going to be two things that make us so distinct from the world that we live in. That's the first two things you're going to see in this section. The third thing is going to be a reward that awaits us. I believe all of us are in pursuit of some kind of reward. God's wired that into us. The problem isn't that we pursue rewards. The problem is we're hardwired to pursue the wrong rewards. And Jesus isn't saying, hey, don't ever seek a reward. Just be a, a martyr and an ascetic and just nothing. It's just, you know, just do good for goodness sake. I think that's one of the worst sayings that we as Americans have ever adopted because it totally removes the reward and the pursuit of doing something for God's sake. It just makes this moralistic claim that good is just good in and of itself and detaches it from anything. And God is a God who rewards. He's a good father who does reward, and he wants us to pursue his rewards, because when we do, it makes us more like him. And then the last thing we're gonna see in this is an example that motivates us. Two radical things that, that change our identity, two radical things that identify us as people who follow Jesus, a reward that awaits us, and an example that motivates us. So if you have your Bible with you, look at Luke chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 20, kind of giving you the preview of what's happened up to this point. And now Jesus is going to turn to his disciples and, and teach these principles that we often refer to as the Beatitudes. It says, he lifted up his eyes on his disciples, his 12 plus a, a lot of people that were there with them, and he says to them, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. I call that the blessing of the dieter. Right? How many of you have ever been on a diet here before? Jesus says you're blessed when you're hungry. But if you just laughed at this, you're going to find out your curse because it's in a minute he's going to say woe to those who laugh. So <laughs> you just lost that blessing. Sorry. <laughs> blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. One of the things I want you to see, and we're going to get into the second part of this, it's just kind of the opposites of it. But it's so important to see that these teachings of the Beatitudes are Jesus teaching us about perspective. I call it eternal perspective, of being able to see past the moment to what's real. This is temporal. It's only here for a moment. And he says, you're going to be poor here if you follow me. You're going to uh, weep at times. It's going to be difficult. You're going to be hungry at times. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be mocked. But he says, but rejoice in that moment, in that temporal moment, because your reward in heaven is great. He's giving us a perspective. All these blessings, if you mourn here, you will be comforted. If you are poor here, you will inherit the uh, kingdom. Like, you're going to have riches beyond anything you can believe, but you have to look past this moment to the future. And we do this all the time with everything we do, right? You put in a, a full work week, sometimes two weeks, sometimes a whole month before you ever get a paycheck. And you're not sitting there going, oh, man, another, oh, man, oh, man. You know, hey, that paycheck's coming, so I'm working towards a future reward. And Jesus is just saying, you're right. There's, a, there's one, you just need to put it out a little bit further than that. Because I don't know about you, but I know it's a principle that's been true in my life. Every single paycheck that I've ever received, guess what? It's been spent. Jesus is saying, there's a paycheck, so to speak. There's a reward you can work towards in pursuing me that will never go away. It'll never end. It's infinitely better in value, and it's intrinsically more lasting than anything you can ever pursue and receive in this world. So he's telling us that here. Then he's going to go on and pronounce it. He's going to flip these around and, and turn them into negative. And each of these parallels ones we just read. He says in verse 24, but woe to you who are rich, 
for you have received your consolation. Notice he's talking about it right here. This, you already got your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. That's kind of an arrogant, prideful laugh that just like, hey, I got everything figured out and I'm in a place of privilege and power and, and everything's great. The world's kind of at my fingertips and he's saying it's going to be turned upside down. He says, woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Notice he doesn't say anything about a reward at the end of that section like he did at the beginning. And that's our first radical change in our identity is this. Following Jesus requires radically new values. Following Jesus requires radically new values. That's what Jesus is getting at in this section. I like how Michael Wilcock, a commentator on the Gospel of Luke, says as he kind of summarizes this little section of Scripture, this is what he says, and I quote from him, in the life of God's people will be seen, first of all, a remarkable reversal of values. They will prize what the world calls pitiable and be suspect of what the world thinks is desirable. That's what Jesus is saying in the Beatitudes, in these principles of life, and these blessings that he has. Not only is he saying, hey, I just want this for you, but he's saying, I, I, I give you a special blessing when you recognize that the values of my kingdom are infinitely different, totally different, and upside down from what you see in your world. And he's teaching us not just that these circumstances result in a blessing. Don't, don't oversimplify what Jesus says and saying, okay, so as long as you're poor, you're blessed. Is that what he's saying? He's absolutely not saying that. Because there are lots of poor people, earthly-wise, that totally reject God. This is what he's teaching here. Obviously, there's the context of all of Scripture. Simply being poor does not act automatically mean you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you're blessed. Any more than simply being rich is a condition that automatically brings that woe upon you. What Jesus is saying is that when our values pursue the things of this world that lead to riches, that lead to comfort here, that lead to satisfaction here just in this temporal sense, then you have to recognize you have had your fill and your blessings here. Because following Jesus will impact your wealth. Following Jesus will impact your comfort. Following Jesus will impact your reputation with people who are not going to like the things that you pursue or the things that you believe or the things that you stand for. And so Jesus is saying in a nutshell, in a simple, powerful, profound way, that if these values in your life, that the world values, wealth, comfort, satisfaction in this world, you know, being accepted or popularity or being you know, well-liked by this world, if those are important to you and are values to you to the point where you will not set those aside or hold them loosely in order to follow Jesus, if they interfere with you following Jesus and being able to, uh, available to follow him and be like him and serve like him and love others like him, then woe to you. You've missed the, the blessing. You have your blessings now. You're going to get what this world offers, but this is all you're going to get. It's going to be the best you ever have. This is pretty profound and powerful and challenging stuff. It speaks right at the heart of all of us. He confronts our worldly values that we so easily embrace and come so naturally to us. But Jesus is saying there's something different that happens in the life of a person who's been transformed by the grace of God and now is on a journey following Jesus. I want to ask a couple questions, and I think these are just questions, kind of rhetorical questions, one for you to ponder and think about that I think surface and touch on these values in our lives and how they might intersect with our life. So, so think about them, ponder them, maybe write these down if, if you want to ponder more about them, but this is one of them. How willing are you to step toward being more financially poor in this world 
in order to be more available to obey Jesus Christ? Ask yourself that. Would you be willing to make a decision that might leave you in less of a favorable spot financially if doing so would allow you to be more available to serve Jesus Christ and to serve others and to carry out his work? Does your current lifestyle require a workload that hinders your ability to serve others and to give generously? Because we often blame it on all these other things, but oftentimes, especially here in America, we have so much. We are the wealthiest nation in the world, and yet as a people, as a nation, if you look at it, we still tend to live just a little bit beyond our means. Even though we have the most wealth we've ever had, we still, as, in general, as people, live just a little bit beyond what we have. It's one of those things of realizing you will never have enough. You will never be satisfied if the world's satisfactions and the world's goods are your pursuit and your end. And Jesus is teaching us that in this passage. He's flipping it upside down to help us realize this world was not what you were originally created for in its brokenness. And it will mess you up if you pursue the rewards and the values of this world. So let me say that again. Does the lifestyle you think you deserve demand a workload and a busyness from you that prevents you from following Jesus and fulfilling the work that he's called you to in this world? Here's another one, if I haven't offended you yet. This one will, I'm sure. (laughs) Is your need for approval and worldly acceptance driving you or your kids to be overcommitted to activities that make you feel more accepted or successful in this world? Or to push your kids or you as an individual or your kids to attending a college that you really can't afford, but you think it will somehow get them a better place in this world. And as a result, now it drives your lifestyle, now it drives what you're pushing for, and now you're less and less and less and less available to serve and follow Jesus. See, what Jesus is saying here is that when you embrace these values in the sense of following him, then the choices you make are going to move you more towards an idea that says, I'm willing to be poor in the world's eyes because I realize nothing in this world is going to last. You're going to see he's not saying he doesn't want us to be rewarded. He's not saying he doesn't want us to be rich. He wants you and I to have a, a riches and a reward that can't be so easily taken away is what we experience here, which is why we continue to pursue more and more and more. We're never satisfied because all more and more wealth does, all more and more comfort does is raise our anxiety levels and our need to maintain and keep and and take care of that stuff more and more, and it doesn't produce nor does it offer the promise that it makes to you over and over again. I can honestly say in the 20 years I've now been in ministry, I have rarely, I'm not saying never, I have rarely seen the accumulation of wealth in a person's life improve their willingness and ability to serve Jesus Christ. More times than not, the comforts and the riches of this world gradually make people less and less and less available. And in case you're doing what maybe I'm prone to do, thinking, well, I'm glad I'm not rich like this guy or girl that I'm sitting next to, the reality is if you live in this country and you are a family of four and you have a household income of $60,000, just a household income of $60,000, you're in the top 10% wealthiest in the world. So sorry, very few of us escape that. We'll make sure we have a phone, we'll make sure we have internet, that we have cable, that we have all kinds of things that will have zero impact. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of those things, but when those things are a greater priority than the kingdom of God, it should sadden our hearts 
that we would pursue something of so little value in so short a time of pleasure than what Jesus offers to us. That's the first radical thing. That was the easier one, I'm sorry. The second thing that radically identifies as Christians, we're going to see as he continues. And these build on each other. You will never be the second person. This is just an outworking of a person who's adopted that first set of values. When Jesus gets into this, don't miss the connection. He says in verse 27, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do without your tunic either. Don't hold on your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. As you wish others would do to you, do also to them. Second thing we see, the second thing that radically changes us or identifies us is that following Jesus requires a radical new way to treat our enemies. Following Jesus requires a radical new way of treating our enemies. You know, the world preaches this whole thing called tolerance, at least its version of tolerance. The funny thing about tolerance is, is even the people who say they're the most tolerant, saying we're tolerant of everyone's views and everyone should be able to do whatever they want. The only people they're not tolerant of is people who aren't tolerant of that particular view. You ever notice that? If you're truly tolerant of everything, then how can you say, well, what if someone says, I don't want to be tolerant and that's my view, yet you're not tolerant of that, it's inconsistent. Jesus is telling us here, we as Christians in a true sense of it should be the most tolerant, gracious people on the earth. And I don't mean by that that we accept and embrace the thoughts and ideas and ideologies of everyone else. What I mean by that is much more difficult. It's not accepting things you know aren't true, but being able to radically love and serve people with vastly different views than you have in spite of them. That's radical. That's totally different than anything our world has ever seen. I love this quote. I don't know who it's attributed to, but uh, I wish I could give him credit, but it's really good. He says this, the Bible tells us to love our neighbors and also to love our enemies, probably because they are generally the same people. (laughs) <laughs> you could put a whole lot of things. You could put your family in there. You could put your coworkers. You could put your church in there, right? Like before I was a Christian, I didn't have a whole lot of enemies, right? I, I, and most of the people I, were, I was friends with, I became a Christian and suddenly I had a few more enemies. You want know how you can get a whole lot of enemies? Go into ministry. Like since I've been in ministry, I've had more people like hate my guts than any other thing I've done. I I probably wouldn't have gotten into ministry, honestly, at the maturity I was at, if I knew how hard that would be at times. How painful some of the remarks of people extremely close to you in proximity could be and how often you have to turn and continue to love in spite of it. Times I've had to wait three, four, sometimes five days or a week to respond to an email that was so cruel that I would expect from someone outside but never from someone inside before I was in a place where I could even respond without responding with what first came through my mind in that moment. I think you probably all know what I mean. The people that you're closest to can also be the people that hurt and harm you the most. But Jesus teaches us in this passage how powerful this truth is that that we love people who are so different than us, that actually hurt and harm us. It's easy to love those people who are lovable back to us. That doesn't take a supernatural transformation in our hearts. But try loving someone and sacrificing for someone whom you know can hardly stand to see you. And you've identified a person who has been so transformed by the person of Jesus Christ that there's no other explanation for how they live. When was the last time you did something genuinely sacrificial and loving towards someone who had treated you so poorly? 
Can you remember? Is it something that's frequent in your life? Maybe it was someone who had a vastly different political stance than you did. Okay, that may be pushing it a little too much. We don't want to be that loving towards someone, right? But let's be honest. How have we as Christians been portrayed in the world during a season during this pandemic and all the political stuff that's been incredibly divisive? How have we come across? Would you say we've embodied this or have we just jumped into the same game that our world does but we just have a certain set of morals that we think are superior to everyone else's, but when it comes down to it, we act exactly the same. One of my favorite books, and, and is now a movie, if you haven't seen it, is uh, a, a book uh, entitled Unbroken. It's a story of uh, Louis Zamperini, uh, an ex-Olympian who then was drafted into World War II was a, a bombardier. And in the midst of a, a mission he was flying on, his plane was shot down in the Pacific. And him and his, the two other people in the plane with him were afloat for several weeks, uh, waiting to be rescued. One of them actually died. It was such a long time they were out there. And they barely survived, but they were scooped up uh, by a Japanese ship. They were taken and put into a prisoner of war camp uh, for the remainder of the war, and he was horribly and brutally tortured that whole time. In fact, once they found out he was an Olympian and kind of an American hero, he was tortured even more as a result of it. Eventually, the war ended, and the prisoners of war were released. He came back to the States. He got married, uh, but he had such horrible nightmares over and over of the torture, and some of them where he was so angry, so frustrated over the injustice that he'd experienced that some of those nightmares would be him being tortured, and then it would be him actually strangling and taking the life of those guards that took him because he was so angry about what had happened to him. So much so that it, it led him into a life of drugs and alcoholism. It pretty much was destroying his marriage, and right at the brink of that blowing up, he attended a Billy Graham crusade. And he met Jesus. And he understood the love and grace of Jesus. And it totally changed his life. And once Lewis understood forgiveness, once he understood a God that could forgive him for everything that he had done, he realized he needed to forgive those who had harmed him. And he made several trips to Japan and tracked down some of the guards who were still living and personally offered them forgiveness, resulting in some of them actually coming to know Jesus Christ as their Savior as well. Such a powerful example of what this passage speaks to us. You know, we live in a day of cancel culture and toxic people, and we have all kinds of guidelines that allow us to just move people outside of our circles and push them away, and I don't need to listen to that, I don't need to be around that, you know, I just deserve to have this nice little comfy little circle, and, and that's, that makes a lot of sense if your values are the world's values. And I'm not saying that there's ideologies or beliefs or things that we just have to embrace, but my, I just have a question for you. If Jesus would have embraced cancel culture, if Jesus would have embraced the, the philosophies of toxic people that we need to remove from our lives, how long do you think his ministry on earth would have lasted? And I wonder if we haven't just adopted the world's values so much to, to protect our comfort, to protect our wealth, to protect our reputation, and because we've built our lives on the shaky grounds of this world, that we have to stay away from people like that because they jeopardize it when our values and our worth is in this world. But when you have an inheritance that's eternal, when you have an inheritance that's anchored in the person of Jesus Christ, when you have an identity that's shaped by the very God of this universe and the son that he sent to die for your sins in mind. How could any person possibly be so toxic that they could impact your eternal inheritance? 
See, this is what Jesus turns upside down, and you see this in the gospel. Up until that time, when you were touched by an unclean person, you became unclean. When Jesus came on the scene, when unclean people touched Jesus, guess what happened? They became clean. He turned this upside down. And he has sent you and I out into a world that is incredibly dirty and messy and ugly with a radical new set of values, a radical new identity to lean in to the ugliness and difficulty of this world. And when you do this, when you choose to love people that are so far outside your circles, guess what? Your wealth is going to be jeopardized. Your laughter may just decrease a little bit because you're going to step into the lives of some people that are pretty messy and you're going to get hurt in the midst of that. And that's okay because your reward is not here on this earth. In fact, Jesus is telling us, rejoice. Rejoice. Take your eyes off of what you think you're losing right now And look at what's awaiting you by the grace that I've shown you. A radical new set of values. Why would we possibly do this? Why would we possibly be willing to risk and lose so much, Chad? I'm so glad you asked that question. Because Jesus tells us right in this passage, in fact, multiple times, you are going to lose your rewards in this world when you live like Jesus. I'm telling you that right now. You will lose them. If you're compiling them and you're continuing to gain them and you're going in that direction, I would challenge you to say maybe you're not living the way Jesus has called you to live because you're piling up what's never going to last. But when you do, Guaranteed, you're going to be challenged with your economic status. You're going to be challenged with how much satisfaction you're constantly pursuing in this world. You're going to be challenged with all the temporary love and joy and and happiness you might have here so that you can find a deeper joy and you can lead others into that deeper joy. And you're going to be challenged by how well you're liked by all the things of this world. But I'm telling you, It is infinitely worth it because Jesus tells us it is. Look at what he says. Following Jesus in this section, you're going to see what it results in. Verse 32 to 35 is one little section, but you're going to see this woven through this whole passage. He says, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? How would you answer that? What's it saying? None, right? When you get questions in the Bible, answer them. They're kind of obvious, but when you say it out loud, it kind of strikes you with the truth. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Meaning, what profit is it to you? It's none. For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those to wh- from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But, he says, this is what's different about us. Love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. Jesus says that following him is is resulting in a great reward. When you follow Jesus, you're going to get a a reward that far exceeds anything you could possibly get in this world. But it's going to cost you to, in a sense, make an exchange. You're going to have to exchange what you can never keep, as one person said, for something that you can never lose. You're going to have to exchange something that is going to destroy and, and be gone and can never fully satisfy in this world so you can receive something that will never leave you wanting for anything. You see, Jesus doesn't want us just to be these ascetic martyrs, woe is me, I don't have anything, I'm just sacrificing all this stuff for God. That's a warped sense of Christianity that makes God not all that satisfying and not all that lovingly rewarding. No, Jesus wants you to be richer than anyone you've ever seen in this world, even Elon Musk, 
right? He moved here. You think he's rich, man. People are following him. He's going to be the poorest guy in eternity. All of you, if you will follow Jesus, will be infinitely richer than him when you pursue those rewards. Because here's, listen, listen to what Jesus said. You remember this passage? We've all heard this. He says, don't store up your treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. He says, don't do that. But Jesus didn't stop there and just say, I just want you to be poor. I want you to, to life to just stink for you. I want you to not have anything. I just want you to be a woe is me. That's not what he finishes that verse with. He goes on to say, but store up treasures for yourself in heaven. Why? Because moth and rust can't destroy those treasures. And thieves can't break in and steal them. Jesus promises it here. It's all over the scriptures. He has a reward for you. A loving, good father has a reward for you. And pursuing God's reward is not demeaning to him. It doesn't belittle him. It honors him. It glorifies him. It reveals that what we can receive from him is better than anything we can receive from this world. He has wired us as people who pursue rewards. The problem is in our broken sinfulness, we think the, the rewards of this world are better than his rewards. And that's what dishonors him. You want rewards? Great. Even the most aggressive people in this world that are going after things, you know what? It's like Paul when he was a, a Christian or a, a not a Christian and he was running after the rewards of the world and the Pharisees and the religious world and he met Jesus and he just did the exact same thing pursuing the greater rewards that Jesus had. And he went 100% towards that because he knew that everything he had in this world, his, his words, was rubbish was a pile of dung, if you know what that word means, in comparison to the value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He has a reward for you. Go for that reward. And Jesus is telling us how. Here's the last thing we see. Following Jesus is fueled by a radical new view of God. And he closes this out with this by saying, uh, just as we saw here, you, you will receive your great reward and you will be sons of the Most High. And he says, why? For he is kind to the ungrateful, meaning God. God's kind to the ungrateful and the evil, so be merciful even as your Father is merciful. This view of God is radically different than any view of God our world has. Christianity is so radically different than any other world religion. You can make some parallels and similarities and teachings, but the view of God is radically different. Every world religion basically says the same thing. You meet these certain expectations, you do these things, and if you measure up, God will accept you. That's the nutshell of every world religion. The gospel flips that around. The gospel says, God knows how broken and evil and ungrateful we are. And in the midst of our sinfulness, the love of God shows up and Christ Jesus takes your place and mine. And he shows kindness to the ungrateful and the evil. That's you and me. See, God doesn't just give us these principles and say, you guys figure this out. I'm up here in the glories of heaven. It's awesome up here. Man, it would be great if you guys could get up here, but you got to measure up to these principles. It's not what he does. God's not just an example. He became a substitute for you and for me. He sent down Jesus to embody every single 
one of these values so that when you see him, when you meet him, when you understand what he does, it, you don't embrace these values so that you can meet Jesus. You embrace them because you have met him, because you've come to realize, oh my goodness, this evil, this brokenness, this person that pursues all these things in this world, that's me. I don't deserve to be with God. I don't deserve the blessings that he gives, but he offers them to me even in my brokenness, in my wickedness in my unkindness, through Jesus. And church, when you meet him, when you understand who Jesus is and what he has done for you, then these values just start leaking out of you. It's not you performing for God. It's you leaning into this grace and this gift and recognizing for the first time, I'm offered something so much better. Like, like I used this picture in the earlier service. I, I asked about like a great steak restaurant. Someone said like three forks or four forks or I don't know, nine forks, whatever it is. You can do a million forks if it's got. But, but this, is the, this is a picture of the Christian life. God's offering this incredible steak Unbelievable. If you're, a, if you just pretend you're a meat eater. I know we're in Austin. There's only a handful of uh, meat eaters or whatever. But just pretend you like meat, okay? You're on the keto diet, right? You're hungry. You're blessed, right? So, and then, and then I have over here, I have a, a, a wonderful hot, right off the press, you know, McDonald's cheeseburger for you, right? And I'm tempting you with it. Hey, you can have this cheeseburger or you can have that steak. Come on, come on. Look at the cheeseburger. Look at that. Look at that mustard kind of dripping off the side. Like, that's not even a temptation, right? You're going to go after and say, absolutely, I want this. And I'm going to say, well, I can give you the cheeseburger now, but if you want the steak, you're going to have to wait till the end of the service. You say, that's not a big deal. It's so much better. Why would I not wait? You see, the reason and what's so important about understanding that God is the greatest reward, and there is rewards he, he gives, you're going to see them, that the moment you sit in his presence, nothing that you pursued in this world is going to seem important at all. And until you grasp that, you will always have this arrogant prideful mindset that you are sacrificing for God and that God somehow owes you something. But when you realize that he has rewards for you that are infinitely greater than anything you could ever pursue and give up in this world, it causes you to humbly let go of the things you think are so great and receive the blessing of what he promises awaits you. Jesus was the richest man to ever walk the earth. If he was here right now, Elon Musk would be a pauper in comparison to the wealth that Jesus had. Think about this. We don't think about this. Jesus owned everything in the universe. We tend to separate him. We forget that he's both fully man and fully God, and yet he was the richest man. He could add anything he wanted at any moment, and yet he chose to live infinitely below his deserved lifestyle. He chose so much so, not just to say, hey, I'm just going to tone it down. I'm just going to live in the second nicest neighborhood or I'm going to maybe send, you know, do this. Or this. He, he went way down to the very bottom so that you and I could be lifted to a place where we can't even fully imagine the heights of the glory and goodness of being in Jesus' presence for all of eternity. He was willing to be poor so that you and I could be rich. Jesus could have been, and he is in some ways, the most famous person ever, man. You can imagine the ministries he could have set up, the people he could have had come and given him donations, the popularity he could have had, the Instagram account, the Twitter account. Like when he tweeted something, man, there would have been billions of followers saying, I wonder what Jesus said today. What's he thinking about Dogecoin? He didn't. Jesus was willing to be mocked, to be reviled, 
for you and for me. In fact, by you and by me. So he could show us a radical love that this world could never fully understand. Man, Jesus deserved to laugh. He deserved to be in power. He deserved to be in a place where no one around him could have harmed him or touched him or, or insulted him or been toxic toward him or canceled him. Instead, he was mocked. He was beaten. He was humiliated for your sins and for mine. Man, he deserved a feast. He deserved to be satisfied with everything this world could offer. But he resisted the pleasures of this world. And and here's why Jesus wasn't a victim. He resisted them because Jesus knew that the reward that awaited him was so much greater than anything he could lose in this world that I don't even know that it was hardly a temptation. The Bible says he was tempted in every way but without sin. I think this is Jesus' secret. Like, Jesus had been with the Father for all of eternity past. He knew how awesome heaven was. And so nothing in this world was going to lure him away from that place again for himself. And nothing in this world was going to lure him away from loving you so much and saying, come with me. I can't wait for you to see the pleasures that reside in my Father's presence. And in his right hand. We don't think about this, but but Jesus, do you ever think that as a man, maybe he wanted to have a family? Do you ever think he wanted to have an intimate relationship like most of us just think we have a right to in this world? That he wanted to have kids and see them grow up? And we just put them into this spiritual ghost-like guru position and remove all the human desires that resided in him just like they do in us so that we can dismiss what he went through and excuse what we often do. But Jesus had every single one of those desires. But he knew the loss of them would pale in comparison to the wedding day he's awaiting when he could provide to make his bride perfect and pure. And he was willing to pay any cost here. Give up anything in this world to show you and I that church, nothing compares to my kingdom. And I can't wait for you to be there with me. I just want you to live like this in this moment so that you can experience everything I have for you for all of eternity. And I, I just, I promise you this. I don't know how. I don't explain it. I don't, I can't see it. I haven't experienced it. I just believe it because Jesus said it. And at that moment, we're going to have this wedding banquet when we as this church are there in Jesus' presence at the beginning of that kingdom. And it says there's going to be lavish food and there's going to be everything you can imagine. I promise you, the moment you take that first bite in that banquet at that wedding feast, you will forget everything that you gave up in this world to follow him wholeheartedly. In fact, there's the Bible right there. Here's Chad over here. Sometimes I just have to share my opinion as opposed to saying something that's right out of here, right? So this may be right, it may not be right. I believe there may even be a moment wherever it happens in that transition to eternity where we'll experience some regrets. Even where it talks about every tear will be wiped away, that's talking about a time period that seems to be happening in the midst of that transition. I'm wondering if at some point in there, in a loving but truthful way, we're going to get a glimpse at all the things we decided were so important in this world that didn't honor and bring glory to Jesus. And we're going to have that opportunity to maybe just have him forgive us and and repent even of that in that transition. And I say that for this reason. Why wait till then? Why not see the beauty and goodness of Jesus now. 
and follow him wholeheartedly for what he has done for you. He is worthy of having all these things on earth. Instead, he chose the greater reward that awaited him so that you and I could also choose that reward with him. I want to leave you with two things, two thoughts, two simple actions, maybe just one of these two. What would it look like in your life today if you were to embrace what Jesus values and pursue his great reward? What would that look like in two potential areas? One is this. Is Jesus worth adjusting your temporal lifestyle in order to live a life of eternal impact? Ask yourself that. Is Jesus worth adjusting your temporal lifestyle in order for you to more fully live a life of eternal impact? Secondly, kind of goes along with that. Is there an enemy in your life that God brought to mind today that he's calling you to radically love as Jesus loves you? Those two things will often go together. Let's pray. Father, so thankful for these truths, as hard as they are, and as much as they open up my heart and expose my fallenness, my brokenness, my shallowness. Um, Lord, I've never read any other book. I've never seen any other truths that speak so truthfully who capture reality so clearly and who expose us to ourselves, to our own brokenness, our own shortcomings. So Lord, let these truths um, shape each of us. Help us to see in them the beauty of Jesus, that he wasn't just a, a neat spiritual leader that lived here and taught some really profound truths. He embodied a lifestyle that's so foreign to any of us. In fact, if we were back there in his days, I think the truth be told, we'd be just as offended by much of what he said. We'd be just as challenged to follow him the way he calls us to follow him because he's worthy of everything we have, even our very lives. So Lord, help us to be a church It's not trying to build our kingdom here in this temporal world because it's all going to burn up. It's all going to rust. It's all going to be eaten by moths and it's all going to be stolen. By the great thief who just wants to destroy and ruin our lives but continues to tempt us with these temporary blessings. Lord, help us to see the richness of glory with you, of relationships that are perfectly fulfilling, that never let us down, that are rich beyond anything we could imagine. So we don't need the approval of people in this world. We can freely love them regardless of how they respond. Lord, show us the riches of your kingdom so that any monopoly-like riches we might have here, we will easily trade in for something that can never be taken away. Only you can do that, Jesus. But you have done it time and time again. May it be true in us. May it be true in our church. And may Austin catch a glimpse of what lives look like when they're radically transformed by the beauty and glory of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray, amen.